Welcome to The Motivational Midwife. My name is Lynn Jones, and today we're going to look at second stage of labour. So let's have a look at the second stage of labour then. So the second stage of labour, we covered first stage in a different session, and second stage is from that full dilatation to the birth of the baby. And what's going on physiologically while this is happening? Well, we've still got our contraction and retraction of the muscle fibres, so they're contracting, but they're getting shorter, and they're pushing that baby down. Um, but what happens in the second stage is you get the um, secondary powers joining in. So you've got your uh, muscles of the diaphragm and the abdominal wall also coming into play um, and pushing that baby down. And when the baby hits the pelvic floor, you will find that there's stimulation of the nerve receptors in the pelvic floor. And what this will um, result in is an an involuntary urge to push that urge to bear down which is known as Ferguson's reflex and as the baby's head descends further into the vagina it, it displaces the pelvic floor so the pelvic floor anteriorly so that's at the front gets pulled upwards along with the bladder gets drawn up into the abdomen so that it's uh, less likely to get damaged and posteriorly it gets pushed down in front of the presenting part and as the head descends further you will get um external signs so uh, if you if the woman is in all fours you may see um some puffiness around the michaelis of rhombus that's that sort of triangle area um you may also see and this is uh it's a very interesting um a sign that you see mostly on caucasian women it's quite hard to see on uh women of ethnicity but there is a purple line that runs up the anal cleft um which uh, roughly equates with dilatation of the cervix. So when they're fully dilated, it's really often very, very obvious, this purple line, and it goes the whole length. Um, you will also see some anal puckering. You may see anal dilatation. You might see feces passed um, as the head comes into the vagina. It compresses the uh, rectum so anything that's in there any feces that are in there are going to be expelled and the midwives tend to get very excited when those sort of things happen because we know that that baby is probably not far off and just a quick reminder of the mechanism of labor which we did in another session so remember you have with contractions you've got descent you've got increased flexion um, as the baby's head hits the pelvic pelvic floor you'll have a rotation of an eighth of a circle forward and the baby's head will be borne by extension you will then get restitution with internal rotation of the shoulders and then lateral flexion um, of the body which will birth the baby so now to the controversial um, elements of the session really time frames um, most trusts really base their guidelines uh, on nice guidance uh, and it's good to have some sort of national body so there is some continuity some consistency across the country however having said that um, guidance is exactly that it is guidance it's not a um, protocol it's not a thou shalt do it is guidance and you need to look very carefully at what evidence guidance is actually based on is it based on good high quality evidence or just expert opinion and much of nice is based on expert opinion um, so really be mindful um, that's not to say you shouldn't follow it but you need to really go into 
looking at guidance with a very open and critical approach. So you're not just taking things as read because that's what that's what NICE says. So that's what we'll do. Um, in terms of time frames, you know, my own opinion is really, should we be having, should we be putting rigid time frames on normal physiological labour? Um, if there are other complexities involved, then it, that's a whole different ball game, and I can understand um, the need for a more structured uh, approach. But when we're in these, we're we'll, um, looking specifically, really, at normal physiological birth, and you have to ask yourself why are we interfering with normal in the physiological birth in in any way, shape, or form? Why are we not treating women holistically? Why are we not treating women uh, individually um, when they come into our care? We tend to have a one size fits all for everybody. Um, and there are a number of reasons that uh, things may, labour may stall uh, for a variety of reasons. And many of them are really quite easily rectifiable. Um, but looking specifically at timeframes for second stage, NICE guidance um, suggests uh, three hours for a primip from active second stage. The baby should be born within three hours. So three hours really of active pushing and two hours for a uh, multiple or a second time mum, which is actually quite a long time. Um, however, if women are pushing physiologically and we are not cheerleading by the uh, sidelines, um, then it may well, you know, take quite a long time. Um, and what is active second stage? Well, remember the difference between you may just happen to find uh, on vaginal examination that somebody is fully dilated. but And so by the definition, they are in second stage, but actually they have the presenting part is high, they have no urge to push. So they're not really in active second stage. So should you start the clock ticking then? I would argue no, um, but in many trusts they do. Um, so you do have to be quite mindful of that whole picture, that holistic picture um, and over all of these things, you must have the woman's wishes at the forefront of your care. Um, um, but in order for her to really make an informed choice, she needs to know all the information. And these discussions really need to be had antenatally when she has time to digest that information and make her mind up about what she wants and what she doesn't want. So thinking about positions, because this is one of the things, of course, that will impact um, the second stage of labour quite a lot. And quite uh, alarmingly, you know, there is still a high number of women when you look at CQC um, reports, a high number of women who deliver in a lithotomy position. So that's on their back with legs in stirrups. And you see this a lot on American TV. I mean, I think almost every woman that I've ever seen on an American birth program, not that I watch them because they drive me insane, um, is in a lithotomy position, which is completely contrary to normal physiology. Most women do not lie flat on their back with their legs in the air physiologically to, to give birth. Uh, and I have to ask myself why midwives, uh, and often it is us, are putting women into lithotomy for normal deliveries. Um, you know, even NICE says avoid being on your back. Um, but what do you do if actually she wants to be on her back, if that's the position she has chosen? You know, in terms of position, again, women's choice should be paramount. Um, she should get into the position that she feels most comfortable. And actually, if you watch women birthing physiologically, they will often get themselves into all sorts of strange positions. And it is as though their body knows the position they need to get into to get their baby through their pelvis. Uh, and we don't know, you know, we make the assumption that most women have got um, 
a uh, gynecoid pelvis. That's the shape of the pelvis. Um, but there will be women that have the other shapes of pelvises, depending on their ethnicity. Um, and, you know, if you look at women and, and watch them, they will put themselves in the positions that they know instinctively will get their babies through. Um, I think we have, um, I'm going to sort of rant a little bit here. I think we have really taken women's power away in their belief in their bodies to do the job. And it's quite a task to actually get someone in labour to believe that they can do it, that their body knows what they can do. Um, so thinking about positions, uh, you know, there is a lot of evidence that the more upright positions um, do facilitate um, the second stage and also in terms of perineums, uh, less perineal trauma, I believe left laterals, if you, on, in terms of a lying position, left lateral is often associated with the least perineal trauma, but you need to think about what positions are going to allow this coccyx to move freely and maximize that pelvic outlet? If she's lying on it or sitting on it, then it's not going to be able to move freely. So think about that, but also think about um, her choice. Where does she want to be? Think about the analgesia she's got on board, because actually that may also have a bearing on the position she's able to get into. Utilise your delivery beds because many of the delivery beds are actually great. You know, they've got buttons that will help you move them into different positions. You can get them into a chair position. Even with an epidural, you can move somebody into a different position, even if that epidural is really quite dense and, and they can't move their legs very well. You can still alter their position. <clears throat> Now, thinking of the perineum, hmm, now this is a very controversial um, debate, which I won't go into massively deeply in this session, but it is one that I suggest you read around a lot. Now, back in the late 90s, there was something called the HOOP trial, which was a hands-on, hands-poised trial, and it was actually looking at uh, postnatal perineal pain, not perineal trauma. However, as time went by, um, a lot of people developed a much more hands-off approach to birth um, and pre that we were really very uh, very hands-on very guard the perineum um, and flex the head when I trained we it was very very interventionist um, but a, a more hands-off approach developed and there appeared to be over time an increase in uh, severe perineal trauma, third and fourth degree tears, that uh, some quarters did attribute to this more hands-off approach. Um, however, other uh, quarters dis did suggest maybe it was we were just getting much better at actually identifying it. However, the result of that was, <clears throat> because obviously we need to reduce the incidence of these very severe tears. Um, some of the evidence says as much as 90% of women will, uh, first time mums will suffer some degree of perineal trauma, be it grazes to uh, an actual tear. But the vast majority of those will be um, tears that will heal very easily with no long term effects. But these third and fourth degree tears, these are much deeper tears that involve um, the rectum, um, or the, uh, the anal sphincter, they can have really uh, ongoing life um, changing implications for women. So, uh, you know, anything we can do to reduce those has got to be a good thing. However, so um, two or three years ago, the Royal College of Midwives and the RCOG um, brought into play the OAC Care Bundle which is um, obstetric anal sphincter injury care bundle. Um, and on the surface of it, you'd think it would, that's quite a good thing, you know, to bring a care bundle in to try and standardise care across the country to reduce these very severe um, 
TES, and it really comprises of four elements, the sort of antenatal information for women about uh, these these really difficult TES, documenting um, the use of manual perineal protection. So that's a really a very hands-on approach to the perineum. Um, and when indicated, um, a mediolateral uh, episiotomy. So that's a, a, a cut that goes at a sort of 45 degree angle. Um, and then following the birth, uh, the perineum being examined, even when she has a uh, intact perineum, undertaking a rectal examination to make sure there was um, no tear gone through. And on the surface of it, you might think, oh, yeah, that's that's not too bad. And just at the beginning of this year, there has been some um, feedback, some studies reporting back on, on the sort of uh, first year or so of the implementation of this uh, programme. However, again, uh, the initial... Um, evidence seems to suggest there has been a very small uh, reduction. So from 3.3 to 3, you know, so 0.3 percent reduction, which is actually quite a tiny reduction. And um, it's very difficult. I, I would say, again, it's trying to put this one size fits all um, to ev every woman. Um, and there is The, the actual bundle itself is quite flawed, in my opinion, and certainly I've put some links. Um, I tend to agree with Ames and uh, the article in All for Midwifery uh, looking at it, uh, which I have put the links below, which, you know, really suggests that some of the information that this bundle was put together on, uh, whilst it came from a good place, it's really not very evidence based. Um, and some of the evidence seems to have been missed out completely when considering this this care bundle, such as place of birth, because we do know from evidence, good evidence, that actually women who have a home birth uh, or a midwife led unit birth have less perineal trauma. And you have to think about is that because they are um, able to have more choice in the positions they choose to actually birth. Um, there is, uh, you know, that it, <clears throat> there really is huge flaws in this, uh, in this trial. And I'm not going to get into to deep and meaningful conversations here about it, but I would urge you to go and really look at the evidence and be quite discerning about um, your practice um, and what elements uh, really are being put into play. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about some of the perineal things that, that can be useful in a second. So thinking about care, um, observations. Um, so um, again, currently it's suggested that in second stage, um, we up the ante a little bit. So we are going to certainly, um, there is more as that baby's head is coming down, there is more chance of, of head compression and cord compression. So the risk of hypoxia for the baby increases in second stage. So we need to be monitoring the baby a little bit more closely than we have been. And the suggestion is that really we should be listening, ideally after every contraction, but at least every five minutes for a full minute. Um, and we should be palpating the maternal heart rate every 15 minutes to just differentiate from that um, fetal heart rate because, you know, she's going to be working quite hard. You'd expect her rate, heart rate to go up um, in second stage uh, a degree or two as well. Um, blood pressure goes from four hourly to hourly. Uh, temperature, no change unless she's in the pool. So it doesn't need to be done um, any longer than four hourly. I, my personal practice is uh, when we get to second stage, I usually do a full set of observations at that point, And then I know that actually I'm starting from a from a good place. There's nothing that I'm worried about. Um, also documenting really about how often she's passing urine, 
um, you know, encourage her to have uh, drinks, isotonic drinks, help her energy levels, support her in any which any way that she she needs support. In terms of pushing, encourage her to, to trust her body, push physiologically. You know, there's still, despite the fact that we know that the Valsalva's manoeuvre, that whole take a deep breath in, chin on your chest and hold that breath and push, 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 is actually really not effective and also detrimental to the baby. You will still see it and you still see it um, used by people who were not trained like that. So it is an institutional and an organisational failing that people get sucked into this way of doing things. Uh, there will be women who will need um, some uh, guidance on pushing, particularly women who have an epidural and maybe can't feel as well. But my, my personal opinion is you should try and mimic the physiological approach when they're pushing. So if you watch women uh, pushing physiologically, they tend to take a breath in. They don't push right at the beginning of the contraction. It tends to build and then they push. But they only push for maybe, you know, eight, nine, ten seconds. Then they take another breath and they push. So if you are, um, for want of a better word, coaching um, someone to push that that is needing that um support in that direction then try and mimic uh, at least mimic a physiological way of doing it it is less harmful uh, than chin on the chest and push 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 um, in terms of perineum there is there is some good evidence uh, about uh, antenatal massage in terms of um, reducing perineal trauma um, and there is some evidence around the use of warm compresses, although it's quite difficult to sort of standardise the, the temperature of the water or all of those things. But there is does seem to be um, some good evidence around um, the use of warm compresses in labour. But again, you need to get consent from women. Um, you can't just slap a warm compress on their perineum. I mean, a lot of women do actually find them quite soothing. Um, but again, it's something you need to discuss uh, when they first come into your care. Uh, how do they feel about that um, and get consent for it uh, before they get that far? More often than not, really, the, the key element with, with um, protecting that perineum is really to have a good relationship with that woman and, and have an, a slow, gentle birth of the head. So it allows the tissues time to stretch up. Um, and women who are pushing physiologically tend to do that um, and women who you can guide to breathe as opposed to uh, you know particularly multips um, you can very often encourage them to just breathe that baby's head out not push at all um, so you know really think outside the box here uh, i suppose my key message really is is treat women as individuals treat each birth as a, a holistic individual um, experience. Don't um, be so rigid in your approach. You really need to not lose that uh, helicopter view of what is going on and, and don't be sort of very tunnel visioned by guidelines. They are important, but they are not the be all and end all. And as I say, they're not always best. Um, they're not always based on very good or high quality evidence. Uh, Pesiotomies, um, the discussion should have been had antenatally uh, and really, um, believe it or not, many years ago um, when I was training, uh, I think it was just going out as I trained, that every primate got a, an episiotomy, uh, whether they needed it or not, because there was a school of thought that um, it would somehow protect their perineums for future um, babies. It was a, a dreadful practice. Uh, and at the same time, of course, every primate or every woman um, had uh, their membranes ruptured at three centimetres as well. It was a dreadful, um, dreadful, dreadful process uh, and a terrible way of doing things. And I don't know who ever thought that was a good idea, but uh, it did occur. Um, and, you know, the history of midwifery is littered with these dreadful, and obstetrics is littered with these dreadful things. Really, episiotomies um, 
there's only a few reasons that an episiotomy um, is indicated. And one is fetal distress. So if that baby is, is in big difficulties and you need to get that baby out quickly, um, if the, it's an instrumental delivery, um, not always a, a von twos because the kiwi cups uh, are not increasing the, the diameters coming out. So you will find that it's not always necessary with a, a von twos delivery. It pretty much always is necessary with a forceps delivery. Um, and uh, very rigid perineums if, if, or if you think she's going to tear very badly. Uh, and that only comes with experience. So thinking about um, analgesia in the second stage, well, often you might have a woman that's got an epidural. Um, you may, if they've got a, a low dose epidural, um, then hopefully it's working well enough that they still have some sensation. If they are um, having bolus top ups, it may be worth either turning uh, an epidural down or off. So she has a little bit of sensation to help the um, the process at that point. Entinox, obviously, they can carry on using as much as they like. Um, some some midwives will take the Entinox away from women, um, but if they need it, they need it. Things to consider about opiates, of course, if they're given in, so that's things like diamorphine and pethidine, is that if they're given in late first stage, um, then uh, they will cross the placenta and your baby is likely to be um, respiratory de depressed. So it's, it may need some resuscitation. Um, but the woman, of course, is likely to be really quite drowsy and, and not quite with it. Uh, water, obviously water is, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the pool and, and water for analgesia. And, you know, providing there are no contraindications, uh, there's no reason why um, women can't stay in the pool for second stage. Uh, and even women who maybe haven't um, thought about having a pool birth may decide that actually they do want one and they um, or they may be using the pool but wanted to get out for second stage and then have changed their mind when they, when they get that far. So really. I would like you to take away from this um, that you need to think, that you need to really be very critical or look at evidence with a very critical approach and don't just accept things because a guideline says so. Uh, look at what that guideline is based on. Look at what the evidence that guideline is based on. As I say, a lot of, of nice guidance is really just based on expert opinion. Uh, and one expert will disagree with another expert. So, you know, be very mindful um, because at the forefront of all your care must be that woman and her baby. That, that has to be your guiding principle for your care and you must be her advocate. And there you have it, second stage of labour. I hope you found that useful. I hope you found it thought provoking and I hope it's made you really think about your practice and what you're doing and what you're seeing. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. And I look forward to seeing you next time.